Attention duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Manchester Moz, Trippy Twin Peaks, and a damn album analysis, plus this day in history with Michael Jackson, Married. And our song of the day by Washed Out on your Morning Monarchy for May 26, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. We are broadcasting live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time for your Morning Monarchy. Coming to you as always from the Peak Portland Studios up here in Portland, Oregon. I'm seeing an article in front of me right now that says people just don't want to move to Portland like they used to. Hope you're doing well whenever, wherever you are, my friends. Friday is the entertainment industrial complex. That's what we analyze on Friday. Each day of your morning monarchy, we look at a different area of the news. Monday's world news, Tuesday's tech, Wednesday's health, Thursday's weird, and Friday, we pull our shoots and float down to Media Memes Island, my friend. We are brought to you by you, and a huge thanks to all our donors and supporters at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. We've got Bitcoin. I'm not sure exactly how it's doing. I've never actually followed the ins and outs and ups and downs of every moment of Bitcoin. I've always kind of treated it like a little tucked away piggy bank that I don't really look into or check into all that much. It's up, it's down. It was crashing by 15% in the matter of a few minutes yesterday. But that's just one cryptocurrency. And just like we've talked about on New World next week, it's not about Uber. It's not about this. It's the ideas. It's the idea of cryptocurrency. And I know a lot of you guys are into other areas and other styles and other brands of cryptocurrency. We might dip our toes into those waters as well. If you've got good ones that we should get in on, we'll ride those waves. Bitcoin, post office box, PayPal, and Patreon.com slash Media Monarchy. Huge, 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 huge thanks to Damon B for a very generous monthly pledge over on Patreon.com slash Media Monarchy. That keeps us going and growing, my friends. If you can give a little, I can give a lot. We've been streaming live again. I MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. We've launched our own stream in case you've missed out on a little bit. A couple weeks ago, Mixler, the platform we had been using for the last year and a half plus to broadcast, they were putting up a paywall. And rather than pay them, we thought we'd just do it ourselves. In the words of Bill O'Reilly, fuck it, we will do it live, my friends. So we've basically been broadcasting live for the last couple of weeks, nine to five, eight hours a day at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Morning Monarchy, your daily DJ set at noon, we call Pump Up the Volume. You also get some news, you get some music, you get some remixes. Tell a friend about MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. And a huge thanks to all of you that are joining us live right now. Maybe your Memorial Day weekend has already begun. It is going to be a big hot weekend here in America. Hot in a lot of ways. And we got a lot to talk about here on your Morning Monarchy. One of the other things I do want to mention, I think it comes out today. We just maybe need to grab Cassie's mom's Netflix streaming login to check out the big new Brad Pitt movie on Netflix called War Machine. Now, it's sort of the fictionalized version of the Stanley McChrystal story that Michael Hastings, the late, great Michael Hastings, wrote for Rolling Stone. They've basically turned that into a movie. And I'll have to actually see it, but there might be a big, hilarious, awesome, media monarchy-related Easter egg in War Machine. So we'll have to check that out over this weekend, and you can report back to me if you've discovered that Easter egg. Let's glance at the breaking lamestream news, my friends. And there's a hell of a lot of it on this morning, Friday, May 26, 2017. Gianforte's victory after assaulting reporter reflects rising tribalism in American politics, so says the Washington Compost. I don't see a little fact check part of this Greg Gianforte story. It's out of Montana. And they had a special election the other day, and right on the eve of the election, one of the candidates allegedly body slammed this reporter. Then didn't I see a day later that the reporter started to walk back some of his claims? This is troll America. This is WrestleMania. We live in it. We soak in it. And the more you take part in conventional politics, the more you're just a goober yelling at WrestleMania. Sorry, WrestleMania fans. Gunmen kill at least 28 Coptic Christians in Central Egypt. Bannon to head Trump's Russia war room. And a seventh grader gets most likely to become a terrorist award at some school in Texas that I think is actually called like Lance Corporal Military School. So that's how they act. So that's, of course, how they're going to roll. We talked about it yesterday. Let's mention it today because it is the actual day. That they're burying the late Chris Cornell at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. 
Morrissey shot a single album cover there. <laughs> Lana Del Rey's done concerts. I think they even show movies sometimes. While we may never know what was going through the mind of late Soundgarden singer Chris Cornell before he took his life in a Detroit hotel room last week, Detroit police have revealed some of the details of the rock icon's final moments. A police report obtained by the Detroit News reveals that Cornell went to his hotel room shortly after the group concluded a concert at the Fox Theater last Wednesday when his wife, wife Vicky, called to check up on him. The conversation reportedly alarmed her as Cornell 52 was slurring his words and sounded groggy, repeatedly telling her, I'm just tired. The latter description also appeared in a statement from the family released last Friday, in which Vicki Cornell and the family's attorney took issue with the Wayne County Medical Examiner's conclusion that Cornell died after committing suicide by hanging. Concerned about what she heard on the phone, Vicki Cornell reportedly asked the band's bodyguard to go check on her husband, who had gone back to his room at the MGM Grand Hotel 15 minutes after the reunited grunge band finished a show in front of 5,000 adoring fans around 11.15 p.m. Bodyguard Martin Kirsten worked in Cornell's computer for a bit and gave him two doses of the prescription anti-anxiety medicine Ativan. At about 11.35, that call between Chris and Vicky, she called Kirsten around 12.15 a.m. expressing concern about her husband's well-being. Kirsten walked two doors down to room 1136 and found the door locked and kicked it open, according to the police report, noting that he had called hotel security from a phone in the hallway asking for help checking in on the singer. Security stated they cannot let him into the room because he's not registered to that room, the police report said. At this time, Kirsten kicked in the door with his feet and went to the bedroom door, and the latch had been engaged on this door. He also... Kirsten again called for security, but could not gain access to the room. Encountering this second locked door, which led to the singer's bedroom suite, Kirsten kicked that one open as well, finding Cornell on the bathroom floor with blood running from his mouth and a red exercise band around his neck. An MGM medic, Don Jones, on the scene by 12.56 a.m., untied the band from around Cornell's neck and began CPR on the singer who was not breathing. A short time later, EMS Unit 42 arrived on the scene, and an emergency medical technician also tried to perform CPR unsuccessfully. By 1.30 a.m., Cornell was pronounced dead by a doctor on the scene. Homicide detectives also arrived to investigate, while an officer called Vicki Cornell to report on her husband's death. Victim's wife stated victim is a recovering drug addict. Later that day, the medical examiner pronounced it as a suicide. Vicki Cornell and family attorney Kurt Passage released a statement disputing the results, saying they needed the results of a toxicology test to know for sure what happened to Cornell. The family believes that if Chris took his life, he did not know what he was doing and that the drugs or other substances may have affected his actions. So there you have it. Copycat grunge carnage continuing. And he's already been cremated, so the funeral today at Hollywood Forever Cemetery is pretty much just kind of a show. Another big pharma murder, my friends. And that's kind of the dark way we get into this rather dark Friday episode of Media Memes. As I was putting the stories together last night, it's like, ah, oh, this is kind of a Holy Hexes Part 2 kind of day. So be warned. The terrorist attack on Manchester that left 22 people dead summoned an inevitable call from a forgotten man. That's the way Paste Magazine says, there's a wine that never goes out. What are they talking about? Oh, they're talking about Morrissey. Now, we've mentioned this and kind of teased this all this week. But earlier this week, of course, famed Smith's front man, Morrissey put out a statement. Here it is in full. Celebrating my birthday in Manchester as news of the Manchester arena bomb broke. Now, this was May 22nd, this past Monday, Morrissey's 58th birthday. He's from Manchester. The anger is monumental. For what reason will this ever stop? Theresa May says such attacks will not break us, but her own life has lived in a bulletproof bubble, and she evidently does not need to identify any young people today in Manchester morgues. Also, will not break us means that the tragedy will not break her or her policies on immigration. The young people of Manchester are already broken. Thanks all the same, Theresa. Sadiq Khan, mayor of London, says London is united with Manchester, but he does not condemn Islamic State, who have claimed responsibility for the bomb. The Queen receives absurd praise for her strong words against the attack, yet she doesn't cancel today's garden party at Buckingham Palace, for which no criticism is allowed in the Britain of free press. 
Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham says the attack is the work of an extremist. An extreme what? An extreme rabbit? In modern Britain, everyone seems petrified to officially say what we all say in private. Politicians tell us they are unafraid, but they're never the victims. How easy to be unafraid when one is protected from the line of fire. The people have no such protections. Signed, Morrissey, May 23rd. Morrissey has always spoken out and spoken his mind. So it's interesting to see magazines like Paste, of course, come out against this. Because all of the sort of mainline corporate-controlled media all pretty much speaks the same dead neoliberal New World Order party line. I was thinking about this just a few minutes before the shows. I found this Paste piece to sort of go counter against what Morrissey was saying. And he said many controversial things through his career. I wonder, what would it have been like in the 80s, say, when the new big fake conservative president came on and it was the new Cold War and everybody thought the poor were going to die and everybody thought the rich were going to get everything? Did music magazines then suddenly get political? Were you reading Cream or Kerrang? And suddenly it was like, oh, there's all these bullshit political articles. This isn't why I read this. This isn't the kind of work that you typically do. But when a fake Democrat gets into office they suddenly never say a word and it's just you know music is normal they love when smiling democrats kill little kids with flying robots they don't say shit but then somehow the fake guy comes in someone they don't like ruling like a unitary executive and they go all nutso now i say that hypothetically because that never happened Magazines didn't do that. We live in a new culture and a new world. So it's really difficult to try and read all kinds of music magazines and culture magazines, who, again, you know, love everything the fake left does. But the second the phony party they don't like comes into favor, they go apoplectic. I had a popular tweet the other day. MSNBC's ratings are great and Fox's ratings are down. This just in, pendulum swings from... Right to left, from left to right. But no one still notices it's still attached to the same bullshit clock. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, May 26, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. There is a wine that never goes out, says Paste Magazine, about Morrissey's accusations and pretty much truth bombs about the Manchester situation. And again... I know how they'll try and force us into these conversations. They give us our heroes, they give us our villains. No one ever gave me Morrissey as a hero or villain, I found him myself. On an interestingly related note, Morrissey actually just signed to, we believe, to a new record label. Now, you may recall when his most recent LP came out, World Peace is None of Your Business, in 2014. Not long after the album being released, he got in a fight with the label Harvest and pretty much said he wanted out and wanted off. And so they stopped selling the record. They pulled it from streaming services. He's hinted at having new material and having new things, but not having a record label to put it out. The other bit of news that came out, aside from that statement from Morrissey this week, officially... On his birthday, he posted the Rebirth Day and the logo for legendary reggae label Trojan Records. Now, Trojan is owned by Sanctuary, which owns all kinds of other record labels. It's itself owned by BMG. But Morrissey always does this interesting thing where he makes the rules about how his art comes out. He got all kinds of garbage when he wrote his autobiography. He would sign with Penguin only if they... Put it out on Penguin Classics. Now, this is the great question in the chat. Why does he need a record label? That's the great question I've asked myself for many years. We are far past anyone like Morrissey needing a record label. He could bypass the whole thing. The only answer I can kind of come up with is that he is sort of so traditional as far as media and music goes. I mean, he's famous for, you know, running the first... New York Dolls fan club in the UK. He was on the side of the Thames when the Sex Pistols sailed down the river against the Queen's Jubilee in 77. He's got published music criticism letters in the NME and other places. I think 
he just likes the traditional setup of it all. And maybe he doesn't want to deal with trying to run his own organization. But you're exactly right, Head, in the chat. That's what I've asked for years when you're kind of waiting for new music. It's like, why do you even need a record label at this point? Maybe he needs the cash advance. That is a possibility, my friends. Let's continue on our media memes on this Friday edition of your Morning Monarchy. Again, I hope you're doing well as we head into this holiday weekend in the States. Well, I was taping New World next week with Corbett earlier this week, and we're off mic a little bit. And he's like, yeah, what's what's Memorial Day? Memorial Day, not to be confused with Veterans Day or Armed Forces Day. Those are for living warmongers. Memorial Day is for all the dead warmongers. And it's pretty much the kind of official, unofficial beginning of summer here in the States. Cassie might even get out of work early today. You can kind of feel the excitement in a way as it starts to head up, and hopefully some of you are feeling this if you're in the offices today. It starts to get a little empty, starts to get a little quiet. Everybody kind of checks out. That's what my old boss at the grocery store would call short time in it. Somebody else is short time in it. Bob Beckel. Fox News Channel said Friday that it had fired liberal commentator Bob Beckel for making a racially insensitive remark to a black employee. On Friday, Fox News fired the five co-host Bob Beckel for making a racist remark to a black employee. Fox News Human Resources reportedly conducted a thorough investigation of the incident within 48 hours. They made a determination that he had to immediately be let go. Beckel was co-host of The Five. The show recently moved to prime time when Bill O'Reilly was fired from the network after sexual harassment allegations. The company has taken extreme measures to better the internal culture following newsmaking scandals. <laughs> Whoa, I love the dramatic violin music. And of course, the irony that they had only moved the show to a different time because of the other sexual harassment host that got fired, the aforementioned Bill O'Reilly. Fox offered no details on the case, but a lawyer for the employee said Beckel had stormed out of his office Tuesday when the man, who is a technician, came to do work on his computer saying he was leaving because the worker was black. The lawyer, Douglas Wigdor, also said that Beckel attempted to intimidate his client and get him to withdraw his complaint in a meeting with Fox executive Kevin Lord. Fox denied that anyone tried to persuade the man to withdraw his complaint and said that Beckel had apologized to him after he was fired. Beckel, 68, veteran Democratic political strategist who's a regular on Fox's The Five, where he discusses stories with four conservative panelists. The show recently moved into Fox's primetime lineup with the firing of Bill O'Reilly. Beckel had only returned to Fox in January. He had been ousted in June 2015 while dealing with substance abuse. With then Fox executive Bill Shine saying Fox couldn't hold the five hostage to one man's personal issues, Beckel subsequently wrote a book, I Should Be Dead, My Life Surviving Politics, TV, and, addi and, and, and Addiction. God, that story gets better. You just, just read the headlines, you wouldn't get all that fun extra subtext. And that's what we try and do here on Your Morning Monarchy, give you a little bit of subtext. On a rather dark media memes episode of Your Morning Monarchy... Now, speaking of Morrissey, someone who directed some videos from Morrissey's 92 record, Your Arsenal, right around those early 90s, was a little guy getting started in the biz named Zack Snyder. That's right. He directed Tomorrow and some of those early 90s Morrissey videos. You might now know him from all those superhero movies that come out every other week from Disney. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Warner Brothers, whatever. <laughs> Zack Snyder has stepped down from directing the forthcoming Justice League movie after suffering a family tragedy. The majority of filming had already been completed of the film ahead of the change in Snyder's circumstance. In a new interview with his wife and Justice League producer Deborah, the director revealed to The Hollywood Reporter his 20-year-old daughter, Autumn, had taken her own life in March. He's now taking time off to look after the rest of his family as they come to terms with her death. In my mind, I thought it was a cathartic thing to go back to work just to bury myself and see that was the way through it. The demands of this job are pretty intense. It is all-consuming. And in the last two months, I've come to the realization. I've decided to take a step back from the movie to be with my family, be with my kids who really need me. They're all having a hard time. I'm having a hard time. Joss Whedon will take over for Snyder, shooting additional scenes and post-production on the DC superhero movie, which is still scheduled for release on November 17th. 
Autumn was one of Zack Snyder's eight children and stepchildren and recently finished a sci-fi novel, which her father and stepmother hope will be published in the future. Snyder said he never intended to publicize news of his daughter's death, but had no choice due to the high-profile nature of his job. Here's the thing. I never planned to make this public, he said. I thought it would just be in the family, a private matter, our private sorrow that we would deal with. When it became obvious that I needed to take a break, I knew there would be narratives created on the internet. They'll do what they do. The truth is, I'm past caring about that kind of thing right now. Warner Brothers president, Warner Brothers Pictures president, Toby Emmerich, said the production company is supportive of Snyder's decision. When they're going through, what they're going through is unimaginable in my heart. Our hearts go out to them. We're not introducing any new characters with the same characters in some new scenes. He's handling the, handing the baton to Joss, but the course has really been set by Zack. I still believe that despite this tragedy, we'll still end up with a great movie. Snyder and Whedon have been working together to make the handover as smooth as possible, while the film's original director said his priorities had changed since his daughter's death. I want the movie to be amazing, and I'm a fan, but that all pales pretty quickly in comparison. I know the fans are going to be worried about the movie, but there are seven other kids that need me. In the end, it's just a movie. It's a great movie, but it's just a movie. Joss Whedon replaces Zack Snyder on Justice League following Family Tragedy. Now, in a bizarre connection... And this is what's great about getting the news crowdsourced. Not only are we crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced. Each day of the week, your morning monarchy has a different hashtag. If you've got news that goes along with that, tweet it at me. If you don't do the tweets, you can always just email james at mediamonarchy.com. Joss Whedon, renowned for making and directing some of the most compelling movies and television shows in the last decade, is making headlines for releasing a propaganda video for Planned Parenthood. In the face of losing many millions of dollars in funding, Planned Parenthood is asking for a lot more superheroes right now, playing on the idea that Whedon has made movies about superheroes. So, Joss Whedon used his superpower. He made a powerful and chilling short film, Unlocked. And what people's lives could look like without Planned Parenthood, the organization opines. It adds, did we say it was chilling? Yeah, very. Now, this article comes from a website I've never seen called churchmilitant.com. And we do have a lot of fans at Media Monarchy. I'm often surprised at the, at the width and breadth and diversity of the fans. And of course, sometimes you get letters and you get comments from people who are like, I'm surprised you even like my show. Joss Whedon presents us with a quick, emotion-laden view into the lives of three women who, at first, live in a world where there is no PP, Planned Parenthood. The first is a woman in a hospital bed dying from breast cancer. The second is a girl in high school discovering that her friend had sex with a boy who has an STD. And the third is a college-age girl discovering she's been accepted to college with a full scholarship, but is also pregnant. The drama plays out pretty thick with lots of slow and solemn music, frowning and crying in blue and forlorn world where the PP door is locked. No mammograms, people laden with STDs, and no opportunity for a woman to live her full life on her own terms. But things change when they give a tug at the door and it opens. The music then goes upbeat, the colors warm up, and everybody's smiling. You see a clean, bright PP facility, young people getting educated about safe sex, and the now college-bound young lady on birth control with her parents smiling proudly at her. Joss Whedon, normally a very thorough filmmaker who's very fond of plot twists, sadly leaves his audience there. Clearly, there's more to PP than he is leaving totally untreated. And that's where it gets gross in the article. Suffice it to say, they are having massive propaganda pushes all around the world. And as has been noted many times in the memes you might see lately, good ideas don't need forced or giant multi-billion dollar propaganda pushes. And yes, I admit I like the odd juxtaposition of Zack Snyder losing a kid to suicide, Joss Whedon taking over and making abortion videos. Those are the interesting memes we like to analyze. Now, following up on a story we covered the previous week on your Holy Hexes Morning Monarchy, we talked about a documentary called The Keepers. Here's a fantastic update on this story from Matt Agarist. And a huge thanks to him for the tweets action. Baltimore police have found themselves in an awkward position as of late after a horrifying documentary from Netflix exposed a dark underground child sex ring involving the church, politicians, and cops. The series, titled The Keepers, has forced the Baltimore police to set up an online submission form as people began to come forward after watching it. 
While the series is on Netflix for the world's entertainment, the harsh truth is that it really happened. After the church attempted to keep it quiet by paying off the victims under the table, the documentary has exposed these monsters to the world. The seven-part series, which premiered two Fridays ago, also covers the unsolved murder of one of the teachers, and this is what we focused in on. Sister Catherine Ann Sesnick. Who killed Sister Kathy is the hashtag. Enough former victims had seen the documentary that they've now begun calling the Baltimore Police Department to report their abuse. Baltimore police have since made an online submission form. BaltimorePolice.org slash news slash sex offense form. We've been contacted by victims from the past who want to report the sex offenses that occurred to them. The murder investigation related to this Netflix series was handled by the Baltimore County Police Department. Dozens of victims had been suppressing the memories of their abuses, and when this documentary came out, it brought the nightmares right back. Originally, many people thought the first woman to come forward was faking it until dozens more followed suit. Now, there is the danger in these types of situations that people will invent things because they saw it on TV. It's like you think you get that illness when you watch that show about this new illness that everybody has. But that is fantastic news, and I think that's a really positive move that some of the media being made, and we've talked about this when we talked about who killed Sister Kathy and the Finders, or rather, the Keepers. Yeah, the Finders, that's a whole other cult we can talk about some other time. You've got the podcasts like Serial, you've got Making of a Murder, you've got actual investigations into the powers that shouldn't be, kinda. Or are they just investigating the regular people? And they're not actually busting the cops, the churches, the schools, the organizations that actively continually carry on and cover up this abuse. If we keep watching them and people keep getting excited about them, they'll actually keep making those things. Now, as long as we're into trippy TV, my friends, it came back Sunday. And I haven't watched a bit of it yet, but I did see the headlines on Monday morning that Portland's own Chromatics had a song at the closing credits of the new return of Twin Peaks. In a year that's brought us some pretty trippy TV so far, Showtime's Twin Peaks revival has managed to uncork the weirdest, wildest, most unfathomable four hours of television you have seen yet on a major media outlet this year. I don't remember when I heard the first rumor. David Lynch and Mark Frost called me and they said, There's something happening here. I figured something was up. He said, have you heard the rumors about Twin Peaks? I said, I actually have. He said, they're all true. I didn't faint, but I did experience the strangest feeling. There was nothing like it. Revisiting all this territory, there's a freshness to it. There's a lightness to it. It's just been a beautiful thing to see everybody. And it's almost as if no time had passed. It is such a group process. You feel like you're part of a team, but something bigger than that. It's spontaneous, it's in the moment, and it's the best kind of acting. The journey that the characters go on is remarkable. The show is very dynamic and has a lot of facets. In my opinion, it, it discovers in a poetic way the whole human experience. It's a big cast, it's a big story. Big things happen. There are so many surprises in the show. Prepare to be a little out of your comfort zone in the best possible way. We knew it was going to be something special. We just didn't know in what form or how. There's nothing I can say to describe it. It's been absolutely wonderful. The return of Twin Peaks on Showtime. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, May 26, 2017. I'm your host, Webmaster DJ, and so much more, James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. However, for some TV networks, the golden age of television is losing its luster. MTV, A&E, and WGN are all cutting back on high-end productions after failing to attract big enough audiences in an increasingly crowded landscape. Their decision to retreat from non-reality series suggests a reckoning may loom for other networks and the studios that make shows. Last year, the industry produced a record number of original scripted programs, a total of 455. John Landgraf, head of the FX network, has warned of a glut that he's labeled Peak TV, arguing the networks and streaming services are making more than viewers can watch. It seems like the era of Peak TV, driven by an explosion of cable originals, is coming to an end. 
So there's a little bit of good news for you. And art imitates life as we jump from the screen to the big screen. Streep, Hanks, and Spielberg sat in on a Washington compost meeting. The trio got an invite to the Washington Democracy Dies in Darkness post, meeting with several writers and editors in preparation for their upcoming propaganda film, The Pentagon Papers. Starring Tom Hanks, CIA cutout. So let's move from must-flee TV to things we'd actually want to check out. This year, Morton Sabotnik is celebrating the 50th anniversary of his influential debut, Silver Apples of the Moon. The 84-year-old composer will be the subject of an upcoming documentary from Wave Shaper Media titled Sabotnik, Portrait of an Electronic Music Pioneer. You know, he keeps going. He's 84. He's out there hitting the pavement, walking, performing. I think that's what's important in this field is that we have some connections to the very root system. It was an excitement. Something was happening and that this old guy was part of it. (laughs) A time traveler they had brought from the past up to the present who was standing on the stage in front of them. The young generations really do understand what I was doing and what I'm doing much more than the, in fact, I don't know even the fine art world cares about what I'm doing. I never would have thought that I would get to 84 years old. I thought 30 would be it. Uh, It happens when you're not looking. The message of my work in my life has been not to forget history, but not drag the instruments of the history into the future so we can have new messages from new media. There she is. The old machine is still going, huh? I wanted something that did every possible thing someone could possibly imagine. People say I'm the father of this and that, and in a way I am. It's like a a father who has a child he didn't know he had. It was clear, I want to go this way while everybody's going this way. (laughs) That's always really some of the best advice. Morton Sabotnik, the legend with a new documentary. In other good news, with art that we'd like and art that we're interested in, Aphex Twin has dropped a strange new video and announced a collaboration with London-based NTS Radio. Full details of what is planned is still unannounced, though. The website he's announced shows a rapidly changing countdown clock and a special code word to get into the website that has yet to be made public. It also features distorted vocals from Mr. Finger's iconic track, Can You Feel It?, and a warped Aphex Twin logo. Aphex Twin announces collaboration with a London-based NTS online radio station. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, May 26, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more. And on the fourth Fridays of the month, we like to do what we call an album analysis. We've looked recently at 22 A Million from Bon Iver. We've looked at Patterns of Light from His Name is Alive. We've even looked at that Rothschild musical. But we recently talked to our new friend, Andy Widows. He's on the tweets at Andy Has Bad Taste. And we've had a conversation about the new Kendrick Lamar album, Damn. Now, our entire 30-plus minute interview will get published today, but let's jump in with a taste of our conversation already in progress about Damn. To keep on the the religious themes, those kind of themes, they also repeat in the Humble video. There's lots of, or they're like kind of Pope outfits and things. Yeah, so the video starts off, uh, Kendrick is dressed in, you know, white robes, it's got the chest, the the pieces going across the chest, looks looks like he's dressed like the Pope, he appears to be in the vestibule or something of a church, and there's a low, it's pretty dark in there except for a lone beam of light shining through the stained glass that's shining on him, and he 
go it, there's him dancing or you know doing his stuff in the church there's a imagery of him with uh seven or three rappers on each side reenacting the last supper there's a scene of him at a with a bunch of people, I can't tell if they're at a, a funeral, a church service, basically standing on a bunch of steps and everybody kind of walks out towards the end. But it, there's definitely a lot of religious symbolism scattered throughout it. And you said, too, there's lots of, you know, lots of backwards, backwards masking, lots of things in reverse. There Just- is. Um, there are. So in Fear, the track there, it plays the... I think it's like the intro. The, it's not him. It's a, another feature. Sings the verse, and then it's played in reverse. And the last track, Duckworth, ends with a gunshot and then sounding like the record is being rewinded, and you kind of hear it speed up, and you almost hear bits and pieces of all the different songs, but they're, they're kind of coming in reverse. And at the end, it rewinds back and starts with the first line of the first verse from the first track where Kendrick says, so I was taking a walk the other day. Let me actually, I think this is what I did go over on the show back on 420. Let me actually go ahead and play those clips from Fear and Duckworth. Every stone thrown at you resting at my feet. What I got, what I got, do I got the stuff. Painting in my heart, carrying burdens for the struggle. What I got, what I got, do I got the bleed. Every stone thrown at you resting at my feet. What I got, what I got, do I got the stuff. Earth is no more, won't you burn this up? I got, I got, I got, I got loyalty, got royalty inside my DNA. Cocaine coins is born like. So what about the idea that the entire album is told in reverse order? That it should actually go from 14 to 1? So that's a theory that I've seen popping around and I've been entertaining recently. There was a, the the album dropped on Good Friday, Mm. uh, April 14th. It originally had a drop date of April 16th. And so there was actually this really interesting internet theory that popped up that based on a lot of the the messaging in a track that Kendrick put out before this album called The Heart Part 4, it it seemed like there was a second album coming, that this wasn't the actual album that was going to be dropped. And, you know, people were expecting, I think he had changed the background picture on his Spotify account to be him standing in front of a blue wall, where on the album it's him standing in front of a red brick wall. The one of the the top dog entertainment producers, uh, I think his name is Soundwave TDE, tweeted uh, before the album was reversed. But what if I told you that's not the official version? And it was followed by a picture of Morpheus from the Matrix, the meme where he's got the you see the reflection. What of the if two I pills. told you? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, there's just all these. A lot of it was kind of made up conjecture, but I like the idea of. A, a hidden album or or some type of additional thing out there the fact that you know damn in its entirety one through 14 it's a good album but i think and i, I can't take credit for this theory I, I found it out there on the internet first the the last track duckworth is really interesting it's about it's based on a real life story involving anthony top dog tippeth who is the owner of top dog entertainment kendrick's record label and his father, Kenneth Duckworth, uh, also known as Ducky. So basically, it tells about Anthony growing up in the projects in Compton, and it kind of it, it's a really beautiful storytelling how he's basically thrown into this this bad environment, and he, he was born into a family with a history of, of crime. So he he was hustling for a while, made did well for himself, got out but pulled back in because a family member was killed and he was planning on robbing a Kentucky Fried Chicken which Ducky Kendrick's father happened to work at so Ducky had heard story that uh, Top Dog had robbed the convenience store years earlier Uh, a customer got killed and so in order to preserve his life he 
basically befriended Top Dog by giving him extra biscuits and chicken every time he'd come in. So Top Dog grew fond of Ducky and, you know, he didn't kill him. I, I don't know if he actually robbed the place or not, but ultimately, you know, they, they survived. And at the, at the end of that bit of the story, he actually says how out of everybody in there, you know, growing up, those two are probably the only ones that are left. And the last line of the album, or the last line of the song, is because if Anthony killed Ducky, Top Dog could be serving life while I grew up with a father and die in a gunfight. And then right as he hits the word fight, there's a gunshot. And that's when you start to hear the album rewind, and it goes to the first line from Blood, which Blood and Duckworth actually have a very similar structure where you have this intro uh, from the con where he's kind of a, a four verse intro there's some uh i think shout out from kid capri and he's ultimately telling a story and blood he's telling a story about him going out for a walk running into a blind woman uh she looks like she's lost something and he's trying to help her find it uh, ultimately it ends with him getting shot and the the question is it wickedness which refers back to the is it wickedness or weakness at the beginning uh -huh. so the, the theory is that in this reversal, you could, you could look at the album from tracks 1 through 14 where it's Kendrick and his father hasn't died and he is a successful rapper, he's doing amazing. Or I think you could look at it starting with track 14 and working your way forward that this is a scenario where Top Dog does kill Ducky and Kendrick ends up not becoming the person that he is. I don't know if he would end up going into a life of crime, still becoming a rapper, but, you know, falling prey to the the worldly goods, you know, more interested in the fame, the money, than actually spreading a good message. And it's cool because you can, the Duckworth ends with that line, while I grew up with a father and die in a gunfight. The first line of the first verse in God, which is the, the track before it or after mm -hmm. it, depending on how you want to look at it, is says, ever since I was a young man, all I wanted to be was a gunman, which I find that kind of interesting that there's almost that tie between the, the first line of the previous track and the last line of the following track or the last line of the previous track and the first line of the following track, depending on how you look at it. And that pretty much reminds me of the line... As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. So I saw Goodfellas yeah. in the theater recently, and of course it's been ringing around in my head, and it's always it's been one of my favorites since since it came out, essentially. So on the one hand, I can look at that and enjoy it, you know, and see the see the darkness in it, and hopefully not kind of revel in it or think that it glorifies it. D oh is, yeah, is is there the possibility? You know, I don't know. I guess a couple of things because I know whenever I do these kind of talks. And put and put this up. I'm definitely gonna get the people who say this is all you know. This is all satanic shit. You know, it's got <laughs> it, it, you, that you're falling for it. And and whether that's David Bowie or his name is Alive or any of the other artists that we've talked about on Media Monarchy and tried to sort of analyze the analyze the artwork and always try and remember art greater than artist. I mean, what? What do you say to people who 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 warn you away from this because it's it's devil music, so to speak? I think it's hilarious. Uh, when I was doing research for this, I, I came across so the whole idea of the Hebrew Israelite. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the the YouTube account, The Needle Drop. He does a lot of uh, music reviews. For sure, for sure. So he he reviewed Damn, and when he got to the, he, he basically completely dismissed the idea of the the Hebrew Israelite people being damned representing uh, Hispanic, black native Americans and to, to put all of the, the injustices that were thrown on them throughout the years, just because uh, of being cursed by God. He thought that was completely ridiculous. I found a video of a group of actual Hebrew Israelites having a meeting discussing this. And they were basically saying that Kendrick's a false prophet. I found another video of a uh, very devout Christian saying basically the same thing, but that, you know, Kendrick's not actually a Christian. He's, he's a false prophet, a deceiver. And it, I think it's, it's up to the, the listener. Find what you want in it. It, I don't see there be, if anything, I feel like there's a, a, a positive message in the album. 
I'm going to stop it right there, actually. <laughs> I had a couple more minutes left on that edit, but I think that's a perfect place to stop it because it is what you put into it. And that works on so many levels. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more. That was just a bit of our conversation with Andy Widows at Andy Has Bad Taste about the new Kendrick Lamar record, almost like a hall of mirrors in a way. Forward, reverse. That entire 30-plus minute interview will be published to the feeds over this weekend. As long as we're talking about music, and we're wrapping up this Friday Media Memes edition of Your Morning Monarchy. Friday's New Music Friday, new release day. Did you know there's a brand new album from Danzig out today? There's also new music from Heliocentrics, Justin Towns Earl, Pet Symmetry, Cowbell, and so very much more. And of course, that, like everything else we say and play in these episodes, will be included in the show notes, so you can check out those new records and everything that we talk about on these episodes. We're going out with brand spanking new music from Washed Out, Super Lush, Shockingly Bold, big, huge new song called Get Lost from Washed Out. But first we got to take that always important stroll down this day in history, my friends. May 26th, 1830, the Indian Removal Act is passed by the U.S. Congress. It's signed into law by President Andrew Jackson two days later. May 26th, 1896, Nicholas II becomes the last czar of Imperial Russia. That same day, May 26th, 1896, Charles Dow publishes the first edition of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. May 26, 1897, Dracula, a novel by Irish author Bram Stoker, is first published on this day, 1897. Jump ahead a couple of decades, May 26, 1923, the first 24-hour of Le Mans was held and has since been run annually in June, one of the, I think, the longest-running car race. 1948, the U.S. Congress passes Public Law 80-557, which permanently establishes the Civil Air Patrol as an auxiliary of the United States Air Force. Paging David Ferry. May 26, 1972, the United States and the Soviet Union signed the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. And on this day in 1973, a little song called Smoke on the Water was released by Deep Purple. May 26, 1981, Italian Prime Minister Alnardo Forlani and his coalition cabinet resign following a scandal over membership of the Masonic P2 Lodge. Propaganda do. The pseudo-Masonic Lodge. P2. Propaganda do. On this day, 1981. May 26th, 1994. Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley were married in the Dominican Republic. And here is a fascinating compilation of clips related to MJ and America's Next Top President. The king of pop pops the question. In May of 1994, Neverland meets Graceland. Jackson weds Lisa Marie Presley, daughter of another music icon. The press speculates that the marriage is nothing but a PR stunt. However, close personal friend Donald Trump disagrees with that notion. People ask me, was it real? And I say, absolutely. Trump invites the couple to his Palm Beach Palace called mar lago I will tell you, they spent the entire weekend in this incredible room that they occupied, and they almost never came out. It was absolutely real, 100%, in my opinion. The next chapter in Michael Jackson's life was just as stunning. Just a few months later, he surprised even his fans by marrying Lisa Marie Presley the daughter of a legend who was approximately the same size as her new husband. People ask me, was it real? And I say, absolutely. They had dated in secret, courtesy of friends like Donald Trump, who invited the couple to stay at his Palm Beach palace called Mar-a-Lago. I will tell you, they spent the entire weekend in this incredible room that they occupied, and they almost never came out. It was... Absolutely real, 100%, in my opinion. So that was not an act. Michael Jackson was actually a very good friend of mine. I knew Michael Jackson very well. Lived in Trump Tower for a long period of time. I would go down to Mar-a-Lago. He actually got married, you know, Lisa Marie Presley, the whole big deal at Mar-a-Lago. They were in the tower. And I will tell you, he was up there one week with her, and he never came down. So I don't know what was going on, but they got along. You know, a lot of people say, oh, they didn't really. They were up there for a week. They never, ever came down. I said, where the hell is Michael? I've never seen Michael. 
but um, but he was a very talented guy, one of the truly most talented people. I knew him very well. I knew the real story of Michael Jackson. You know, when he died, uh, I would watch people get on. I, I don't want to mention names, but people that you know very well and people that you interview, and they would talk about Michael Jackson. They, they didn't even know him. I mean, very few people got to know Michael Jackson. But uh, he was an unbelievably talented guy. He lost his confidence. And he lost tremendous confidence because of, uh, honestly, bad, bad, bad surgery. He had the worst. He had people that did numbers on him that were just unbelievable facially and, you know, the plastic surgeons. But Michael was an unbelievable talent who actually lost his confidence. And, you know, believe it or not, when you lose your confidence. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the clip just ends there. Because I don't think he knows anything about losing his confidence. MJ and Lisa Marie married on this day in 1994. It's so bizarre. I know we've, and, and of course, because we've never had times like this, we've never had an America's Next Top President who has so much floating out there in the world. Just a ton of, a, you know, I mean, the simplest of it are just his tweets from the last few years that, of course, you can retweet from 2015, where he talks about Saudi Arabia, all the stuff. Complete lies and showbiz PR. But then all the hilarious bits where he got awards from Jesse Jackson and he was on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Oh, good Lord. Brave new world, my friends. Let's continue to look at this day in history. May 26, 1999, the Manic Street Preachers refused to play a concert because Queen Elizabeth Beast II was present. The group had vowed to never perform for the monarchy because they considered it an outdated institution. And finally, May 26th, the first National Sorry Day was held in Australia on this day, and reconciliation events were held nationally and attended by over a million people. I believe they've probably changed it to National Sorry Not Sorry Day. Holy moly, quite a batch of birthdays today on this May 26th. You ready for this? Mamie Smith, Al Jolson, John Wayne, Robert Morley, Peter Cushing, Ruben Gonzalez of Buena Vista Social Club, Miles fucking Davis, born on this day. Brent Musburger, Levon Helm, CIA spy Aldrich Ames, born on this day. Mick Ronson's birthday, Stevie Nicks, Jeremy Corbyn. It's also famed wiki creator Ward Cunningham's birthday. Pam Foxy Brown Greer, born on this day. Philip Michael Thomas, born on this day. Oh, I've got the Don Johnson album. I should get the Philip Michael Thomas album. They put it right next to my Bruce Willis album. <laughs> it's also Bo Cephas' birthday, Hank Williams Jr., Sally Ride, Bobcat Goldthwait, Lenny Kravitz, Helena Bonham Carter, Matt Stone of South Park, Lauren Hill, Phil Elvram, Pacific Northwest singer, songwriter, creator. You might know him from the microphones in Mount Erie. He is making right now some of the darkest music around. He actually lost his wife last year. There was a recent interview with him, and one of those local free rags I don't like to look at unless I'm out at a pizza joint. It's also Isaac Slade's birthday, lead singer of The Fray. That's a pretty banging bunch of birthdays today. I'm sure a couple of those might make it into our daily DJ set at noon, which always begins with vinyl at noon sharp. Pacific time at mediamonarchy.com slash listen. Same place you're soaking in right now, my friends. And we'll hope you join us there. We give you an hour of news in the morning as your morning monarchy and an hour long music set each and every day. That's 10 live hours where I'm actively right here on the microphone giving you news and information. In addition to that, we've basically been streaming live eight hours a day, nine to five at mediamonarchy.com slash listen. Click that link. It should open your iTunes, your VLC, your Windows Media Player. It can play in some browsers. And we'll try and work out exactly the new chat and hopefully the new stream and the chat you can actually do in one place on Discord. There's probably about half a dozen or so of us now over there on Discord, D-I-S-C-O-R-D. It's kind of a gamer thing, but I don't think you have to be a gamer to use it. We're going to use it for our own purposes, my friends. Getting rid of the things we don't need and moving more towards what we want and what we need with real intention. Then we can do it with all each other's help. I appreciate you. Now, I think as we are heading into Memorial Day weekend, I need a little bit of time off. I think we're going to at least take Monday off this coming week. That is the Memorial Day as it's recognized and observed here in the States. 
So I can say with some pretty big confidence, we'll take Monday off. But again, always love to hear from you. James at MediaMonarchy.com. We're on Skype. We're on Wire. We're on Discord. All as Media Monarchy. Love to hear from you. We're going out with banging new music from Ernest Green out of Georgia, a.k.a. Washed Out. Get lost, my friends. And that does it for the Friday Media Memes edition of your Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Thanking you so much for listening, my friends, from the bottom of my heart. And reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedy says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.